Hello and welcome to Enterprise Linux Security, episode 64. Uh, strange little fact, that's my favorite number. Um, maybe something about Nintendo 64 as a kid or the Atari Jaguar being 64-bit. That number's legendary, just like this podcast. So as always, I'm here with Zhao, and today we have Nikos with us, and we're going to talk about FIPS in this episode. Yeah. How are you guys doing? Hi. All good. Hi, Jay. Hi, Nikos. Hi. As always, it's a pleasure to be here on the, the podcast with you. 64, so many, never expected that. Um, yep. Yeah, the, so to give some context before we actually dive in, this episode with Nikos was supposed to happen, to have happened a few weeks back, but there were some cloud issues and we actually <laughs> moved this one back a bit. Um, but yeah, we're cloudy. finally... Yeah, it was definitely cloudy. <laughs> cloud issues. Um, so yeah, we finally got to it. So we're going to be talking about FIPS today, and we have um, a friend of mine from from Texcare, um, Nikos, and he's going to be our resident FIPS expert. I don't actually want to use the word expert, but another one eludes me at the moment. So hi, yeah. Nikos. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah. So thank you, Zhao. Thank you, Jay, for having me. So I'm Nikos Avrianopoulos. I'm director of product management at uh, Taxcare. And I like to describe myself as someone who makes cybersecurity easier to, to manage uh, on Linux. Uh, my background is security compliance for Linux systems. Uh, I have worked in the past for Red Hat Security Engineering at the Ubuntu product team. Uh, and I like to think that I have done a small part to make Linux systems not just a little more secure but and more suitable for the enterprise world, but also a little easier to use. Yeah, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's more than just a little, um, because everyone's modest when they work in technology. So that's definitely a good background there. And also, you know, being in compliance with security, that um definitely um fits our topic for today mm -hmm. around FIPS, which is, you know, admittedly something that I don't know as much about myself. I, I have worked with compliance before, but I don't have nearly as much experience. So I feel like in some ways I'm a bit of a student today as well, which I, I enjoy that because I love to learn. And that's what it's all about is just getting, um, you know, getting something out there. And this would be one of our foundational episodes. So if we talk about FIPS in the future, we don't have to define it. We have an entire episode dedicated to it. We can always point people back to. So there's going to be, um, you know, people watching it into the future, which is always fun because it's uh, some technology never changes. Like I could do a video on Bash and chances are in 10 years, it'll still work. And, um, you know, FIPS is probably way more modern, which you could correct me if I'm wrong and might even have more changes, but foundational episode all the same. So I think what we want to do is probably start with what FIPS is in the first place for uh, people like me that are relatively new to the idea. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question, a very good start. So FIPS is a cert certification that focusing on, uh, focuses on validating cryptography. So mm -hmm. in, in short, it validates that the product conforms to uh, data protection standards set by the US government. Uh, and what does it protect? What does it take to protect from? Uh, in, in brief, it's about uh, that you don't have a cryptographic algorithm designed by me or, or, or you and, and claiming that it's secure, uh, that the algorithms are included uh, in some uh, in some standard that uh, they're including as part of the NIST certification process and they're proven ones. So mm -hmm. it's a way to, for a reputable source to actually confirm that the stuff that you're using for securing your data and for your communications and all of that, that's actually secure and it's not just some random guy on the internet claiming it to be, right? Certainly, that, that's the intention. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's the intention. I, I mean, we've done 63 episodes now where the, the intention was just that an intention and something didn't actually go according to plan, but yeah. Yeah. Just um, like in Jurassic Park, they said some of the worst things imaginable started with the best intentions, right? Yeah. But it, it's, uh, it, and also we, we've talked about when, um, you know, you, you just Google search for any type of security solution that you're thinking about using, whatever category it is, I don't even have to give you one. And you'll find probably a bunch of websites at the top that say, 
we have the best security product or bulletproof this, or, you know, they make these claims that can't possibly be true. And, um, you know, it's hard to know, it, are they, is even if they're not claiming perfect security, even then it's like, there's a, a claim of security. Uh, how exactly do we know that it's really secure? Because even the things that are on the television, on the news, that have been broken into, pro they probably said that they're secure. I don't think I know a security product that ever says, hey, we're kind of secure or mostly secure. I don't think anyone wants to buy that. So um, if I understand correctly, then it's a way to, to validate those claims so that people know that, okay, that, that when it comes to cryptography, this is something that we could uh, you know, most likely trust. Is that a fair assessment? Exactly. That, that, that was the original, uh, that, that was the original uh, idea behind PIPS. As the U.S. government, they wanted to be able to to say uh, these products comply with our baseline. It's the minimum baseline that, uh, and for today's standards, I would say this baseline is kind of uh, low. Usually, uh, products that you see in the market, they are much better than that, or they're repeatable products that they are in the market much better than the baseline of it. <coughs> Sorry, but the intention was to have uh, basic things done. Uh, for cryptography that you have uh, algorithms that are approved for example that you use aes for encryption uh, that you use uh, uh, hashing mechanisms that are uh, known like uh, sa one at the time and now it's more like sa 256 that you use public cryptography that has sufficient strength and so on are you trying to tell me I can't use SHA 256 forever? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, to be, you know, to be fair, you know, it's important to, to under, you know, to use a strong cipher and everything. And um, it, it's good to have something to measure that. Uh, what would you say is the, the use case, uh, you know, who should look into this and its relevance and whatever its benefits for um, organizations, for example? Why would someone want to consider going down this route? So the the problem is that uh, there are many security certifications. So let's say if if you look uh, is is this product secure? If you want to compare two products, which one is more secure? There are many ways to do it. You can find uh, a security certification that claims that another security certification that does that. But FIPS was the first actually security certification that had teeth in, in the sense that there was a buyer behind it who was willing, the US government, that was willing to say, I will only buy products that have FIPS. Uh, if they don't have FIPS, I will not buy them. Uh, so in practice, that did a change in the market of uh, security. That's how uh, Red Hat, for example, that was one of the first Linux systems that had FIPS uh, SIP. Uh, that's how it, it helped uh, to bring Linux on the enterprise level. And it goes down the chain, right? So if you're trying to do business with a federal agency or something like that, if you're trying to provide the service and you can show that you're FIPS compliant, everything has to be FIPS compliant that touches on cryptography, right? If you acquire a service from a third party to you that you then somehow related to this, it also has to have that compliance, right? Exactly. Um, the, the rule for US agencies or for uh, companies that uh, do business with the U.S. government is that they must have FIPS for uh, their systems. Exactly. They must comply with FIPS to protect sensitive data. Yeah, um, I'm sure some people that are listening are probably wondering, okay, but if I if the only thing that I need to to look at is if a system is secure or not, why don't I just run the tests myself? Why don't I just deploy it to different versions that I'm testing? I want to see which one is more secure. Why don't I just do it myself in house? This is actually a pretty involved process, right? Yeah, and the answer is you can actually do it and maybe even better than FIPS, but not every organization wants to do that. And they, I'm speculating here, the idea behind the US government making it a buying requirement is that uh, you cannot trust each and every agency and each and every organization to do their own testing. You, you have to provide a certification process that helps everyone. And, and and you need some form of standardization, right? 
So if somebody would just look at, say, OpenSSL and somebody else would just look at the cryptography inside the kernel or something like that, that wouldn't be comparable then. Yeah, you, you need a tick box in, in the end because this is how usually this is done. Not Nobody checks the details. Do you comply with FIPS? Yes or no? Because it's a much easier process. Yeah. Um, so how is this done? How Imagine I'm, I'm ahead that, uh, say, canonical and I want to get a certification for a new Ubuntu 50 that's going to come out. How do, would I go about uh, this process? Yeah, but let, let me first bring a disclaimer here because uh, I'm also working on a FIPS uh, pro product. So I'm working on AlmaCare, a product that extends uh, the Alma Linux community operating system uh, for the infrastructure organizations. And we have designed AlmaCare for uh, for the FIPS standard. So I would say that I, I am not an impartial uh, player there. Uh, but let's go back to your question. Could you repeat it, please? Because sure, sure. I no, I, I'm interested in the in the process. How does somebody go through and get a certification like this? I mean, I can have a piece of software or a new Linux distribution or something like that that has cryptography in it, and I want to certify it. Um, is the process easy? Is it fast? Where can I do it? Yeah, that, that, that's a very, very good question. And there, uh, so FIPS uh, cares only about cryptography. So the certification itself certifies cryptography. And ma many times we hear that, uh, for example, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is FIPS certified or Ubuntu is FIPS certified. Actually, what, what we mean by that is that the some cryptographic packages that are included in this operating system have received a FIPS certification because the FIPS certification doesn't apply to the operating system itself, only to cryptography. Uh, so, mm -hmm. for example, OpenSSL included in uh, in an operating system is certified. Uh, and how this process uh, w works, uh, so the certificate is provided by NIST. It's a US government agency. And mm -hmm. the agency must verify that the uh, product submitted uh, implements the cryptography according to to the standard there is the FIPS 143 today a uh, standard that consists of uh, 500 other standards that specify how the random generator will be how uh, the cryptography will be how, how uh, I don't know the integrity protection will be it defines all the aspects of uh, cryptography there and as part of the certification, there are tests. There are uh, tests done by uh, a lab. Uh, what, what we call in the process a lab is a uh, is a contractor. Uh, let's say I, maybe maybe I don't explain it very, very well. So, what, when you are a company like uh, that, you would like to certify something. You go to a lab. You don't interact directly with the NIST and the uh, and the lab. Uh, is an accredited organization by NIST mm -hmm. that actually does the testing, uh, test to validate the cryptography, uh, audits the implementation and the use of the cryptography, uh, and does a lot of low level things like do runtime tests, uh, catches the application with the debugger to actually verify that the memory is zeroed after, uh, the, after the, the, uh, the keys are erased from memory after they're used and so on. That seems a pretty involved process. How long does yeah. it take to get something certified on average? Uh, it, because the, the process is rigid and actually uh, it tries to test a lot, it takes a lot of time. And that, But that's also a drawback of the certification process because in practice it takes eight to 12 months to actually certify something like OpenSSL, sometimes that's even true. more. <laughs> So it then, basically takes longer to certify this than it does for me to write an entire book and get it published. <laughs> <laughs> and then for how long is the certification valid? It's not eternal, right? It expires after some time. Exactly. Uh, the certification by, by the book it expires after five years. Uh, but in practice, the software, like the open and sell version you certified, uh, it's actually out of date. <laughs> A few months after you submit it to be certified, because CVs have been found, uh, so there is no software that will remain secure for five 
say for five years without any problems found. Uh, so actually, if you stick to, to the letter and you only run certified software, you always have vulnerabilities on your systems. That's kind of interesting. You're trying to get yeah. certified for security and you're immediately being vulnerable. Yeah, and th that's something that vendors try to, to improve. So each vendor have their own story, how they try to tackle this problem by by providing updates, even though if they're not certified or doing other ways. Uh, yeah, th that's something also known by NIST. They know they are not doing well there, uh, but they don't also don't provide a, a practical solution so far. And there's no better alternative, right? Most of the other certifications, anybody can claim to have any certification that they want, right? Uh, yeah, but but there is also there is also not another uh, certification with actual uh, uh, that it's a buying requirement, uh, yeah, a purchasing requirement. FIPS is the only one. Yeah, as we've talked before and we've discussed this a few weeks back, um, you mentioned that some of the others are just for marketing, right? Exactly. You see a lot of certifications that uh, security certifications, or they claim to be security certifications, and they say uh, you you can certify on this platform, and then we do common marketing. Uh, it, it's more or less like that. There are a few others that are uh, elaborate uh, as well. There is common criteria, and, and I, don't, I don't want to miss some others, but common criteria is the most uh, rigid one uh, and sees more than just the cryptography. But it has pretty much the same problem as FIPS, that is a very slow process. <coughs> yeah, that it is seems hard to fix. It seems like, you know, it's a slow moving process around security, which is always a fast moving process. Um, one question that I have, um, and maybe something you, you just said already answered this, but let's just say, for example, you know, I have a product and it's, uh, or maybe it's a Linux distribution and it's, um, you know, certified and, and that's great. But knowing Linux like I do, um, there's so many packages in the repository. So, if I had a legacy piece of hardware that needed like an older driver and I install it, am I invalidating that test immediately? Because what's stopping someone from, you know, from the repository pulling it down or installing a third party repository and in installing a weaker cipher that would, I'm assuming, probably invalidate FIPS if that's present? Is that true? If I understand correctly your question, uh, this is a problem that is actually uh, occurring right now. If you if you go to a, even if you go to a certified system five years ago, uh, it will not pass the today certification because the certification is also changes uh, the algorithms can get deprecated. Uh, so if you go maybe ten years ago, that there, there existed a protocol called SSH one. Uh, right. Today, you you cannot connect to any system if you uh, deploy an, an old desktop with SSH one support. Uh, Thankfully, you will have. Yeah, I, I can't remember what it was, but I ran into a hardware device that I had to enable SSH1 to access, and I decided not to use it <laughs> at that point. I'm like, okay, no. Um, that that. So one thing I want to talk about um, from my perspective, obviously I'm not an expert on FIPS, but it, it sounds to me like the value is the same as something else that I ran into around uh, SOC 2 compliance. And there's so many other certifications out there um, that I probably couldn't possibly name them all. but um, the, the reason why the company I, I worked with went with that because they kept hitting this wall, the sales team did, where they want to get new clients on. But if a client required a certification in order to do business with us, then um, we're out. If we don't have that certification, then the salesperson doesn't make the deal because that could be a hard requirement for them to, that they can only do business with companies that have that certification. So um, while I hear you know how, you know, time consuming the process is and and some individuals might say well that doesn't sound like something i would want to do the as i understand it correct me if i'm wrong the issue is that like when you have msps and all these other companies that want to do business with other companies especially government there's going to be those requirements and um that literally makes or breaks your company's ability to get that deal or get that contract with that company or that product and that 
could be the driving force. Am I correct on that? Exactly. Uh, yeah, do, doing business with others who have this requirement is actually what drives uh, FIP so far. But you, you can also see it as, as a, I, I am not very familiar with the food, food industry, but it's like some stickers you see on some certain food that uh, it can be the brand that says the, these bananas, for example, have been uh, processed by, by, by these companies that, that you trust, or it can be certain, uh, I, I don't know, there's some stamps where you use uh, here in Europe to, uh, uh, on fresh meat. Mm -hmm. You have a stamp, you know, it, it was processed using a process that is certified, whatever that could be. Yeah. yeah, and and sometimes you don't even look under the hood. You just see the stamp and you trust it implicitly. Yeah. And that's actually part of the value of some certification like this. It implies that at least you went through the effort of looking at security, even if, like you said at the start, it's the bar is a bit low. Um, I mean, we're at version 140-3 now, uh, so there have been other versions and this keeps evolving. So I imagine the bar gets a bit higher each time, or at least tries to get a bit higher. But uh, I don't know. What I'm trying to, to get at, is it more of the absolute minimum that you need to do? Or if you get uh, this type of certification, then OK, your cryptography is absolutely safe, and you don't need to worry about it anymore. Uh, I, I would say uh, FIPS started as a data protection, but it has focused a lot on cryptography. And cryptography is only a part of data protection. You need many more mechanisms to actually protect data than just cryptography but fo focusing I, I would say the bar for cryptography is very good it ensures that you don't have uh, random uh, algorithms there uh, written by uh, my son or, or i hope my son uh, writes actually cryptography at some point but today he cannot uh, it, it, it ensures you have a decent level of cryptography, I would, I would say. So for cryptography, it's good, but it doesn't cover the, the bigger aspect of security. Uh, uh, and actually, the security updates is one uh, uh, the, the major flow in, in the current certification. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, make, that makes sense to me because it's kind of like... Um... Certifying the cryptography is making sure you're not using a weak cipher. It doesn't mean that your password for the admin account is an ABC123, right? Because that's a that could be a different thing. Um, but as long as the cryptography, crypt, excuse me, cryptography around it is uh, appropriate, then that could pass the test. Um, and, and you're going to see products. And I was just doing a quick Google search. Like even YubiKey, uh, excuse me, Yubico has YubiKeys. Yubico is a company. YubiKeys are the product, and they have FIPS keys as well. So you'll see FIPS certified devices out there, uh, which uh, it might be a requirement because maybe your organization is not able and cannot use something that's not compliant. But then when you have a, if you want to use YubiKey, then they have a product that's compliant with it. Then uh, my understanding that opens the door to then considering uh to consider using that what one thing i wanted to take on um from the chat here there's a question from alex about um wireguard um and i i haven't used wireguard to confirm or deny this but it's in the uh, linux kernel and apparently it's not fips compliant one thing to keep in mind when it comes to the linux kernel is that um, almost everything seems to be a module that you can simply check or uncheck so if you have a linux distribution that you know, it's going to take the source code of the Linux kernel, compile a kernel, include it in their distribution. They have full control over which boxes they check. Typically, a distribution will have a text file that has like, you know, the selections, what's enabled, what's not, what's a module, what's not. So having something in the Linux kernel does, it's not like, you know, Windows or Mac OS, it's in the kernel, there's nothing you could do about it. It's a module in this case. So um, if I'm not mistaken, the process of becoming FIPS certified, that would probably include um, things in the Linux kernel that would need to either be present or not present to facilitate that requirement. Is that a correct understanding? So uh, I would say mostly yes. So the, the Linux kernel has a lot of things, as you said, and usually the certification focuses on, on the crypto part. Mm -hmm. Uh, WireGuard is borderline crypto cryptography because it's uh, it's an implementation of a protocol. Uh, 
it's a it's a custom protocol so in 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 the view of FIPS, it's something that is non-standard so it will be hard to standardize unless you make wireguard the actual standard the source code of wireguard uh, in comparison ipsec is a standard protocol you, you it's implemented in more than just uh, the linux kernel it's implemented in uh, routers in, uh, in many other uh, uh, environments mm -hmm. the tls protocol the, the same way the ssl protocol uh, so so yep. wireguard is kind of tri tricky there itself it's uh, is a custom protocol it was designed to be fast it was designed to be uh, non-agile so it can be simpler than the other protocols uh, mm -hmm. but it's still a custom protocol yep and it's up and coming it's, it's interesting how long something has to exist in order for it to be common in the enterprise it's you know what is the saying like uh, something has to be 10 years old to be considered for enterprise typically so um well very it's obsolete it yeah. may be standardized. <laughs> That's true. And then the Linux deprecation period. I mean, how long are we going to tell people to go to IP Route 2 when we're still including the other network packages? It's like I joked at a convention over the weekend when someone was asking about deprecation. I'm like, yeah, the deprecation period is in Linux is probably, what, 15, 20 years at this point of them telling you it's deprecated before people actually stop using it. So I, I think in some ways we kind of need something like this to kind of force our hand a little bit. I actually can't recall the exact feature, but there was something on the latest kernel version that they were deprecating something that they announced they were going to do like six months ago. So it was I was amazed at how quick that went. Um, but I can't recall from the top of my head what it was. Uh, regardless, the, the wire guard thing here, I believe it was about the, the performance more than anything else. And, Work operating outside of the kernel meant that there, there had to be some context switches and some security functions that got in the way. And operating directly inside the kernel would give you like, I don't know, 10x improvement in speeds. Um, right. Which on the Windows side is still a problem because the because the driver operates outside of the of the the actual kernel space in Windows and it's very slow. Um mm -hmm. but yeah, I digress. Um, so you mentioned before that um, that you're launching the, this certification for Alma Linux, right? With Alma Care. Right, and and it's our, actually our intention to to strike a balance between uh, security, uh, security updates, and, and compliance. Uh, we would like to follow an approach that uh, gets the best of the of two two worlds: very fast security fixes while keeping the certified algorithms uh, intact. For which version of Alma Linux? Uh, we're going to, uh, this is work in progress, but we intend to start with 9.2. Nice. So it's very current. So when the certification process <laughs> ends, we're only going to be one version behind, right? <laughs> yeah. We'll be supported for a while, this enterprise. <laughs> but yeah, it's always funny to me, like the, the difference between consumer level support periods where you could barely get a, a smartphone that'll last you two years of support. And then you, your company has a Linux distribution that could be su supported for up to a decade, depending on the distro. It's just a big difference. Or even more than that, right, Nikos? Yeah. Extended support. <laughs> exactly. What we realized while we were designing Almacare is that organizations that deploy systems, uh, they would like to update them fast, but they don't know how what fast is and when they would be able to 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 update them. So, so uh, organizers want to have something that actually can stay as much as they would like to align with their own uh, with their own pace of working. Mm -hmm. uh, some they would like to keep it for five years. Some they're fine uh, updating their operating system every year. Uh, but most, uh, or at least the most traditional organizations, they deploy something and they leave it there for as long as they can. With, yeah. with AlmaCare, we have set the, the line at 16 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's and pretty that's good. Massive. <laughs> <laughs> that, for, that's pretty good. I mean, that's that's you know pretty much, uh, that, that's a big amount of time. Um, I, I don't think I've ever used a <laughs> Linux distro for more than like two years before upgrading it, let alone 16. That'd be interesting. <laughs> You were talking before, Jay, about about people only looking at uh, new versions after a few years. 
I don't know how accurate this is or not, but banks are are an example right. of that. They only approach new distribution versions when they enter extended support. So that's around five years after release. That's when they deploy the versions. Um, yep. And the, the idea there being stability. When they deploy that version, they know there are not going to be any massive changes because there's only security fixes coming in during the extended period. Um, yeah. And that's a pretty good example of this. They're also uh, the, actually, the because... individuals keeping that, or at least they were, I don't know if they still are, keeping Windows XP alive because, you know, older versions of Windows, they, you know, sunset, but that doesn't mean you can't get support. You just have to pay for the patches to be made. And, you know, you have banks actually paying for patches to be produced for operating systems that are end of life just to keep them running that much longer. So that doesn't surprise me a bit, actually. <laughs> The British yeah, Navy. And... <laughs> sorry, Nikos, go ahead. No, what I wanted to say, and sorry for interrupting, was that we, we are in the, we are, at least our backgrounds are from the technology world. So we are used to test a new Linux system uh, every six months or every year or, or mm -hmm. uh, every couple of years. But uh, we, we don't realize that most organizations, technology is not their main focus. Yeah. Uh, they just deploy something and they want to do big working uh, for its lifetime. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, the, the challenge there is can we make something for that? And the, the challenge there is that the migration process is actually pretty convoluted. You're not just upgrading the operating system when it reaches a certain age. You have to take the entire application stack ahead with you. Um, if you have, say, a, a website that's mildly complex, that's written in PHP or whatever, and you update the DOS, chances are very good that the, the, the PHP versions that you're using for the website will break on the new one because they'll be updated. Mm -hmm. And the, the code that you wrote for the previous version will never run properly on the new one. Then PHP is actually famous for those breaking changes between versions. I um, ran into that recently. Yeah. Um, so the, the process is actually pretty convoluted. <coughs> and one of the things that's happening right now is with the, the CentOS 7 expiration. It's going to end next year. So people are, and when I say people, I mean people at large enterprises with large deployments within the thousands of servers. They're starting to realize around now, or if they haven't, they're going to get a pretty good reality call soon, um, that they need to prepare the migration process away from CentOS because they're not going to be supported moving forward and they have to have a path forward. And the, the time that it takes both to plan and to test and to go through all the hoops and fix all the annoyances that crop up and all of that, it's a very long process. It's a very long convoluted process that might take much more time that what you are actually expecting so one year out is not that much two years out is more or less appropriate depending on the size of your deployment but it's a very tough decision that you make as a cio as a CISO, that okay now we need to move our systems from this version to a different version so having the systems run on the same version that you deployed that you know your applications are running or your applications have been certified to run on or have been developed to run on specifically, that those systems can run for a very long time, that means that your return on investment is much better than if you have right. to switch like every couple of years, every five years even. So there is a really strong incentive for having these very large periods of time where you get support. Yep, yep, agreed. And this is the only industry where you could start a project a year ahead and still be considered a procrastinator. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Nikos, we've been talking about FIPS and certifications. It's not like in the past there haven't been some surprises there, right? So there is some actual interesting stories about um, security algorithms being broken in very weird ways in the past, even if they were considered safe at the time, right? I'm thinking about the, the elliptic curve thing. Yeah, uh, right, right. Uh, it's not common. It happened once, but the security community has agreed that uh, we, we have at least a, an example uh, of a, a nation actually uh, trying to uh, insert into the certification uh, an algorithm that was actually broken. Uh, 
Mm. Yeah, the, the FIP certification contained one option for the random generator that was believed to be intentionally uh, weak. Uh, now, no, no one can actually know for, for, for true unless we have some internal communication uh, outside of the uh, secret agencies, but it, it, can, it can happen, it is a risk, and then it matters who your vendor is and whether you trust them to understand what they implement and what they certify. For, for example, this elliptic curve uh, used as a random generator, it, it was not uh, used by a, any Linux vendor. Uh, the, the Linux vendors, uh, they had their own uh, stuff. They could figure out that uh, this doesn't make sense to be used as a random generator because actually this algorithm was broken and intentionally weakened. Uh, it was very slow. Uh, you could implement any other option from the standard and it was a uh, hundred times faster. This particular one was very, very slow and it was, uh, uh, when my role was actually to to check these elements, was, I, I was very curious why this was even there. Why would you even standardize such a slow random generator? Random generators, you want them to be fast. Uh, yeah. Isn't it interesting that even if it was as slow as you say, and if it wasn't that uh, that widely used, that it was still targeted for some weakness like this? It's, it's interesting, and it was even interesting to see it implemented in spe by specific vendors uh, to be included in their products as the default option. Uh, yeah, but uh, we, we cannot say more, 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 more than that. Uh, <laughs> Um, th th this question was loaded actually and just today, a couple of hours ago. I saw this news about a conference where you had uh, some people that are very famous in the, um, the cryptography space. Um, actually, the people behind some of the letters in RSA, um, they were asked about. Uh, the risks of quantum computing with cryptography and the the idea here is that at some point the quantum computer will have enough computing power to break all of the current uh, encryption so yeah what's the point in investing so much in encryption if it's all going to be broken and the way that they framed their response was actually quite interesting they actually said that no oh, but don't worry about that there's going to be so much encrypted data that nothing important is going to be found there's too much noise to to signal ratio so even if somebody breaks that in say 20 years they're not going to find anything interesting and i found that particularly dismissive yeah. I mean, the the way that they made it sound was, oh, don't worry about quantum computing. Just continue to use whatever you're using right now that it's good enough. And knowing that at least in one circumstance, and it wasn't so widely used, we had the backdoor in one of those encryption algorithms, it kind of gives you, at least it gave me the idea that, okay, why are they so insistent in not worrying about this? Should I worry about this immediately? Um, yeah, so... I don't know, it triggered that that alert, <laughs> made that alert go off in my head yeah. about it. Um, so so think, think that the experts, uh, I, I started working in cryptography in the beginning of two, 2000. Uh, so uh, quantum computing was, uh, at the time, it was believed to be 10 times, uh, in 10 years uh, far. Mm -hmm. So we expected quantum computers that can break the existing cryptography would be 10 years far. I, I did my PhD in cryptography in 2010. It was exactly the same. We expected quantum computers to break cryptography 10 years ahead. Now we're 2023. We think quantum computers are 10 years ahead. So cryptographers have grown up with this and, and they got tired probably of that. And they said, okay, fuck, uh, uh, sorry for a word. Uh, forget about quantum cryptography. It's, that... it's it's too, too, too far ahead, probably. Maybe now we're closer. Maybe now we're closer. And uh, actually, the standards or standardization organizations have started actually taking it seriously. And the, uh, uh, NIST itself had a competition uh, to mm -hmm. find the next uh, algorithms to, sta uh, to standardize for post quantum cryptography. Quantum resistant, and, right? Yes. Yes. And, and, and we're getting there to have. The standards first and the implementations afterwards and we will go we are going to switch gradually to uh quantum resistant algorithms 
so we will not have this risk anymore <coughs> but i understand the perspective of the cryptographers who grown up in in this uh, environment i guess that's one way to to look at it um i mean we've seen in all the time when I was in, in university as well and doing my, my research and all of that as well. Um, AI was that fun thing that everybody liked to, to say would someday be very good and could translate text and all of that. And suddenly we're there and it, it now operates exactly like we expected it to do in a few years. So I don't know. That probably was a wake-up call for some people that some of the things that we imagined to be so far off in the future that we're not considering at the moment might just happen tomorrow or something like that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I don't think they being so dismissive about it, even if they are approaching it with that perspective that you just said, if it's that accurate or not, considering how things have gone in the past, say, three, four months in the AI space, for example. Yeah, I, I would say I, I kind of wonder, you know, it's like I, I don't completely understand quantum science, but then I wonder, how do we know that we that quantum computing didn't arrive several times, but every time we observe it, it changes and doesn't exist anymore? <laughs> okay, that's another whole other you're topic. Think, you're thinking about the Star Trek episode for sure. No, I don't know. Quantum science is one of these crazy things I read about that. Uh, yeah, when you start reading about quantum science, oh boy, that's a big topic. <laughs> It's, um, a, it's a very interesting field, and, and we are going to see a new generation of cryptographers uh, specialized in, in, in that, who, who may give a different perspective to cryptography and may uh, lead us to the breakthroughs you, you, you mentioned, actually. Uh, for now, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mystery for most of the people in the traditional cryptography field. So, yeah, we can, we can assume that... Uh, getting a FIP certification means that at least tries to mean that the the cryptography part on the product that you're using is reliable and is dependable yep it's it's a decent one it has it for it's on the baseline i, I would set it as the base it sets the baseline the the minimum line you shouldn't consider something uh, uh if it doesn't have it and i, I would say now if you're not thinking as a US government official, maybe you want a product that has FIPS supported, but not enabled by default, because FIPS is also very uh, stringent. It has options that uh, an average uh, user or a user in Europe may not care about. Uh, <coughs> but you, you would like to have a product that has actually been tested for FIPS. Mm -hmm. We've actually, we've actually this, this talked about um requirements from the US government getting into products and then obviously the, those products are not restricted to the US market so you're probably going to see something that was certified for a certification specifically required by the US market that makes its way to European markets and to other parts of the world so in a way if you have your product certified FIPS you're not going to remove the sticker when you sell it in Germany or France for example so people will know what it is and will realize that that's the baseline that it was created for. It was, it was tested against, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think it's a good thing to have a, a way to test cryptography that's objective, that is not, uh, please trust me, I have amazing cryptography there. Uh, it's a, it, I don't <laughs> think it's a good approach. I, I, I like to have objective tests. Yeah. I yeah can trust is getting harder and harder <laughs> nowadays, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely um yeah so there are there are a couple of questions on the on the chat around the fips compliance versus fips certification do you have some insight on that so so depending on who, who you speak they mean different things by these terms fips certification is that you have uh, you have actually gone through the validation process you receive a certificate uh some people, that, me, FIPS compliance is not an official term of anyone. Uh, you hear it from salespeople or marketing people and people working in the field uh, <coughs> of FIPS. Uh, what it, they usually mean is that, uh, yes, we haven't gotten the certificate, but we are very close to meeting the standard because of this and that. 
Uh, and an example was CentOS. For example, CentOS was a derivative of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It shared the source code. So some people were assuming that it's good enough for FIPS because it's very similar to the original operating system that had a certification. Uh, at, at the same time, mm -hmm. nobody can, can tell you whether it has been compiled the same way, whether, whether it, it is uh, exactly uh, the, the same. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds and, like compliant is more of an intention and then you know being certified is certified but then there's the intention we mean to be or we're about to be or we check the boxes but we don't have the certificate to back it up that's uh, that's interesting exactly actually maybe that's a a, a better description of it that our intention was to 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 comply as much as we can Yep. And we that's... already talked about intentions once in this episode <laughs> already. <laughs> uh, so I won't make the same Jurassic Park reference again this time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Nikos, thank you very much for joining us today yep. and for sharing your knowledge of FIPS with us. Again, from as lay people looking out, it's always like looking at encryption, encrypted data. Um, thank you very much for clearing the, yep. the ins and outs of FIPS and how we can get it and for telling us about it for AlmaCare, for example. Um, yep. And yeah, thank you very much. And we hope to see you back in the show again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed the questions so that have a nice day. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Until the next one. Bye. See you in the next one.